Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming again for our research seminar. So today we're really happy to have with us uh, Michael uh, Poli, who actually is an architect, which is amazing. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's our second seminar. We still have uh, two more to come uh, this term. So I hope to see you in the next one next week. It's uh, about development and inequality. And then we have in the same one about inflation. I'm sure everyone here is curious to know what's happening. So hopefully we're going to get that sorted on the 7th uh, of September, oh, December, December, yeah. So yeah, so thank you everyone for being here. So Michael Poli, um, you know, he's an expert in regenerative design and biomimicry. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So yeah, I did Google about that. I have to admit, I didn't know what that was. So just to tell you, and I'm sure Marks can say much better than me, this is the emulation of models, systems, and elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex human problems. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I feel a bit embarrassed that I didn't know about that before, but uh, that's amazing. So yeah, so um, more than that, Michael, he uh, established uh, his firm, co-exploration architect architecture in 2007 uh, to focus on high performance building and solution for circular economy. And uh, the company actually has developed a groundbreaking office project, um, uh, ultra low energy data center, uh, zero waste textile factory, and progressive solutions for green cities. Uh, well done. And prior to that, uh, setting up exploration, uh, Michael worked with uh, Green Show for 10 years and was central to the team that designed the Eden project. He is uh, regularly booked as keynote speaker and here as well, thank you, uh, on innovation and his TED talk has, uh, has had over 2 million uh, viewings. So just to give it more so you can see how uh, this talk is very important, Michael jointly initiated a widely acclaimed Sarah Forest project which goes back to 2012, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the latest version uh, of which was opened uh, the King of Jordan 2017. So the Sarah Forest Project basically aims to provide fresh water, fresh, sorry, fresh water, food, and renewable energy in hot, arid regions, as well as revegetating areas of inhabited deserts which is amazing as well. Sorry, I keep saying it's amazing because it is. Uh, so yeah, I recommend everybody to have a look um, into that. So finally, in 2019, Michael co-initiated Architects Declare Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, which has spread internationally uh, with over 7,000 companies sign up to addressing the planetary crisis. So as you can see, uh, it's amazing to have Michael here discussing such uh, an important topic that we are all very much uh, interested. So <laughs> we also have with us Kate uh, Kedward, who is one of our own here. She's from uh, IPP and she will be the discussant today. So Kate is an economist at uh, you see our IPP <laughs> with a research focus on sustainable finance. Uh, Katie started her career in capital market at the Royal Bank of Canada as a government bond and derivative specialist. Didn't know about that. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, prior joined a UCL, she worked in a green banking at Share Action, uh, the responsible investment in EGO, and as research for George Monbiot, uh, focusing on sustainable food systems. Uh, Kate holds a master's degree in ecological economics from the University of Leeds and a first class degree from the University of Cambridge. She has contributed to publications, publications such as LSE Business Review, Open Democracy and Brave New Europe. So uh, Kate sits on the advisory uh, panel for Positive Money UK um, and NGO campaigning for fair, uh, NGO campaigning for fair, democratic, and sustainable financial system. So again, another fantastic discussant. So yeah, I think that's it for me. Uh, so Michael, we have forty minutes. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for involving me. Thank you all for coming. So I'm convinced of two things. I'm convinced that we could create a positive future for everyone on planet Earth. I'm also convinced that we're not remotely on track to do that at the moment. So I'm going to describe what I think is holding us back, what the new kind of mindsets are that we're going to need to uh, achieve that. Um, and by way of background, uh, as Carolina said, I was uh, part of the core team that designed the Eden Project. And then when I set up my company, I brought together teams to develop transformative projects, such as this one. This was a, a zero waste, zero carbon textiles factory. 
Um, this is a, an ultra low energy data center. Uh, this is a building that can be grown uh, through min mineral deposition in seawater. And uh, then this is the Sahara Forest Project, which I'll be saying a bit more about. Now, while I was working on these, um, it became quite frustrating that the most regular bit of feedback I was given was these I ideas are great, but the market's not ready for them. So some of these got built, but a lot of them didn't. And this became increasingly frustrating. And if anything, it was getting more difficult to realize green projects. And then the turning point for me came in October 2018, when the IPCC issued their report showing that you know, we've only got 10 years to bring about dramatic reductions in CO2 emissions. And it was, you know, it was clear that 30 years of sustainable design, conventional sustainable design, had not got us anywhere near to where we need to be. And this just seemed insane. You know, the, how, is, how is it that I was being told that the market is not ready for these ideas, and yet the best scientists in the world are telling us that we're edging closer and closer to collapse? So I decided I wanted to um, collaborate with others to try and change this situation. There was no point working on more and more transformative projects if the conditions weren't right. So I started two new collaborations. One is this book, uh, which I co-wrote with Sarah Ichioka, and then the other is uh, UK De uh, Declares a Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, which I jointly initiated with a friend of mine, Steve Tonkins. And I'll say a bit more about that at the end. Now, both of these were inspired by Donella Meadows, the great systems thinker, who argued that the best way to bring about change is to intervene at the level of the mindset or paradigm that drives the, the, the way the system works. And so in our book, Sarah and I set out to really explore what was going to be involved in the shift from sustainable to regenerative. But let's rewind a little bit. How do we get to this point? So I think the high watermark of sustainability in the UK was this building. It's called One Brighton. It was designed by FCB Studios and by Original in 2009. That was designed to a one planet footprint, really comprehensive, holistic approach. 10 years later, it really felt as though the debate had narrowed until you know, to the point where architects were only really talking about carbon. And um, oops, um, the, the, some people call this carbon reductivism, where we, we focus so much on carbon that we exclude a lot of other important issues. And there were certain sort of policy setbacks that you could point to, like the coalition government acts the Zero Carbon Buildings Programme. But I actually think there's a, a deeper pattern underlying this. And when Sarah and I started researching our book, we got very interested in a model called the uh, Adaptive Cycle Model. Uh, it's by two ecologists, uh, uh, Holling and Gunderson. And they studied complex systems initially in biology. And, and what they found was that these all followed a, a similar pattern. And the same is true for a lot of other complex systems. So the pattern they found was that complex systems go through four distinct phases. So there's a, there's a growth phase, followed by a consolidation phase, eventually leading to a release phase, and then a reorganization phase. So to clarify this, in, in nature, an example would be, let's say there's a clear area of land after a forest fire, the first things to arrive would be pioneer species. <coughs> they change the, the habitat slightly, make it possible for a, a wave of other colonizers to come in. And eventually that, that moves. So that's the growth phase. And then eventually that turns into the consolidation phase as it turns into a mature ecosystem. And then as it goes into that phase, it becomes more and more resistant to change. So in this early growth phase, it responds to changes by adapting to them. In this phase, it becomes more and more densely interconnected and interdependent and resistant to change. So it eventually becomes quite fragile and it's susceptible to, say, a for another forest fire or an insect infestation. And whereas uh, this phase can take um, hundreds and hundreds of years, the release phase can happen in a heartbeat. Um, and then that goes back to a reorganization phase and a potentially quite different growth phase. Now, what I think is really interesting is that Holly and Gunderson have applied this to um, social and economic systems. So, for instance, the American car industry, uh, you know, after Ford invented the Model T, there was a, a growth phase, and then the market started to get dominated by a limited number of players. That was the consolidation phase. And the first release was the oil crisis in um, 
in the 1970s. The industry lost a lot of market share to the uh, Japanese uh, car manufacturers and it went back into uh, reorganization and in many ways went back to its, its old kind of bad ways. And the next release phase was the financial crisis of 2008. And what Obama did was he uh, bailed out the, the, the industry, which really just returned it to this late consolidation phase. And what would, have, what would have been more courageous is to have said, sorry, you're not fit for purpose. We're going to give this money to a, a richer, a more diverse ecosystem of um, innovative, smaller companies. Now, I think this also works across different timescales. And you could apply this to the, the whole um, modern era, starting with the um, um, Industrial Revolution. Resources were abundant. That was the growth phase. And then I think the consolidation phase is the period since 1970, the period of neoliberalism, when politics became more and more dominated by big, big, by big business, and they became closer and closer to um, funding politics and the, the media uh, as well. And um, I think that goes a long way to explaining why there's been so little progress in addressing sustainability and climate change, etc., over, over the last 10 years. So the question is, you know, how, do we, how do we change this? How do we bring about a, a release? And I think we need three things. We need to show that we've got the new solutions and mindsets clearly articulated. We need to show we've got the skills to deliver them and overwhelming public demand. And in our book, Sarah and I argue that what we really need is, is more about culture shifts than, than technology. And we set out to explore what is going to be involved in this shift from sustainable to regenerative. And this diagram, I think, explains it quite well. So this is from Bill Reed, and it shows different levels of um, environmentally sustainable design, starting with conventional practice, which you could call one step better than breaking the law. Above that is uh, the realm of green design and relative improvement. And above that is fully sustainable, or as Bill McDonough calls it, 100% less bad. Now, the problem is that most of what we've been doing is kind of somewhere around here, which means that it's just part of a, a degenerative cycle. And so it's clear now that somehow we need to get above that line into the realms of regenerative design. Um, and just as we had spirited debates 20, 30 years ago about what the ultimate in sustainability meant, now I think we need to have an equally lively debate about what the ultimate in regenerative means. And I concur with Bill Reed and others in, in believing that it's getting to the point where we've completely overcome our dualistic separation from nature and we are participating and co-evolving as nature. And I'll explain a bit more about what I, what I mean by that. And in, in the book, we, we do set out quite a lot of quite sort of high philosophical ideals as well as much more practical descriptions of, of how we might achieve that. Now, I think some of these shifts have the status of, of ideas that are hard to argue with. So, you know, the idea that we need economics within planetary limits, the idea that uh, less bad is not enough, uh, the idea that we ultimately need to integrate everything we do as humans into the web of life. I, I think those are broadly accepted now. But where there is still a, a, a lack of clarity, perhaps, is in how we practically achieve that. So I, I hope um, I'll be able to uh, clarify some of that. And in our book, we, we have five chapters, each of which describes a, a fundamental shift. So possibilism is about how we maximize our agency. Co-evolution with, with nature, I'll be talking about shortly. A longer now, that title comes from Brian Eno's work, and that's about long-term thinking and a more nuanced idea of time. In symbiogenesis, we explore human nature and look at how some of the latest social science suggests that far from being kind of cruel um, individuals in a competitive zero-sum game, uh, actually there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, that humans have an amazing capacity for altruism, for empathy and cooperation. And if we use that as a starting point for cities, I think it would lead to really quite a different uh, urban form. And in the final chapter, Planetary Health, we take on the, the vexed subject of, of growth. And our conclusion is that neither growth nor degrowth are good purposes to drive an economy. And what would be much better is if we set, to, set out to maximize planetary health 
as, as the North Star. So I only have time to talk about two of these. I'm mainly going to talk about co-evolution of nature, and then I'll talk briefly about a longer now. So co-evolution with nature. Firstly, I think it would be useful to just spell out a little bit more about some of the shortcomings of the existing paradigm. So this shows three completely independent studies uh, with, which are fairly consistent, and the average trend uh, reaches a critical point in the early 2030s. So that's the European male sperm count, which shows that, uh, according to current trends, we'll be sterile as a species before, long before we get to zero carbon. And yet, hardly anyone is talking about this. And I'm sure that a lot of that is to do with the way we make things, you know, the kind of sloppy chemistry that we use that uh, emits a lot of things into the environment. So as another explanation for what I mean by carbon reductivism, let's take the example of a hydroelectric dam. So you might think, well, once a hydroelectric dam is built and you've paid back the embodied carbon, then everything you get from that point on is zero carbon. So that's great. Well, not really. Because in North American forests, we know that most of the nitrogen actually came from the ocean via vast flows of salmon up rivers, the salmon were eaten by bears and eagles and pooped out into the forest, nitrogen taken up by the trees. So when you block that, uh, <coughs> that uh, path of uh, nitrogen, the forest becomes more fragile, more susceptible to forest fires, which is a carbon nightmare as well as all sorts of other things. So if we f focus solely on carbon, we risk missing the bigger picture of system health. And then um, this is quite an amusing story about what can happen if you intervene in a complex system in the wrong way. Uh, so this was Borneo in the 1960s. The World Health Organization wanted to do something about malaria rates. So they sprayed a lot of DDT around, mosquitoes died, malaria rates went down, so far so good. What happened next was this kind of expanding wave of unintended consequences. Because the DDT also killed the wasps that predated on the thatch-eating weevils. So, Without the wasps, the, the, the weevils just ran amok, ate their way through everyone's straw roofs, roofs collapsed, World Health Organization felt responsible, so they replaced these with corrugated iron roofs, which meant that people roasted in the hot weather and were driven nuts by the rain in, in the rainy season. And then the DDT bioaccumulated up the food chain, because the insects were eaten by geckos, the geckos were eaten by cats, the cats died, the rat population went exponential. And then the World Health Organization, fearing an outbreak, outbreak of bubonic plague, mounted what is surely their most bizarre operation ever. They mounted Operation Cat Drop and parachuted <laughs> <laughs> large numbers of cats into Borneo. So this shows what, what can happen if you intervene in a complex system. But, but, you know, the, these are, settle down, the, these are all, um, these are all examples of, of, of what can go wrong. But of course, it's perfectly possible to um, intervene um, in, in more positive ways. So, uh, you know, we can rethink manufacturing to enhance human health. Uh, it's possible to generate clean energy in ways that regenerates nature. And it's possible to intervene in complex systems in ways that deliver multiplying benefits. So um, I think a good place to start is with the way that we relate to nature. And a lot of people, such as Jeremy Lent in his book, The Patterning Instinct, have argued that this is really at the, the, the kind of core of our problem, the fact that we have this dualistic separation from nature, which started with the ancient Greeks and reached a kind of extreme version with Francis Bacon and, and René Descartes. And I'm not suggesting that, that you hold those views, but the... The fact is that our economies are heavily based on this idea that nature is something separate that can be plundered for resources. So we really do need to overcome that. And while the idea of everything being connected might have been regarded as a bit of sort of new age at one time, now the science absolutely backs that up. So if you look at the idea of the human microbiome, we know that our human cells are outnumbered 10 to 1 by microbial cells. And all of those microbial cells are dependent on the wider ecosystem for oxygen, nutrients, and, and, and water, and so on. So where is the boundary to us as humans? Well, I don't think it's anywhere near as distinct as it once was, because we are fully dependent on that web of life. And what that means is that we can learn a lot about how to rethink design by under, trying to understand how planet Earth works as a complex system. And looking at uh, James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis's uh, Gaia theory, 
there's, I think there's quite a lot that we can draw from that. So if we look at what materials are used in biology, 96% of all living matter is made from just four elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Of the remaining 4%, that's nearly all a further seven elements. So as Janine Bainius has pointed out, nature uses a very limited and safe subset of the periodic table. We could also learn from the way that nature has evolved to assemble those materials into incredibly efficient structures. This is an enlarged um, model of a section through a bird skull with these incredibly thin layers of bone. So very, very resource efficient, using quite complicated shapes. In nature, um, materials are expensive and shape is cheap. Biology has also evolved to put things together with uh, other clever features like interfaces. So this is abalone, it's a seashell, and if you look at this under a powerful microscope, you can see that it's made out of these layers of calcium carbonate connected together with a flexible protein. And that gives it amazing resistance to crack propagation. At a chemical level, it's almost identical to ordinary blackboard chalk, but because of these interfaces, it achieves 3,000 times the toughness. So if we could learn more from the way that nature uses materials and assembles them, then we could go a long way towards achieving a near-perfect circular economy in which materials are cycled endlessly in closed-loop cycles. All right, so we've talked about the right materials, assembling them in the right way, and now thinking about buildings and cities. I think the most persuasive model comes from Biomimicry 3.8. That was the organization set up by Janine Benius and Dana Baumeister. And what they argue is that the way we go about things at the moment, it just doesn't go anywhere near far enough. And what you should do when you're starting a new building or a new piece of city is you should start by identifying how a mature ecosystem in that part of the world should function. How much carbon does it sequester? How much oxygen does it produce? How much water does it filter? How much wildlife does it accommodate? How much food does it produce? And those should become the metrics for your new piece of city. We're nowhere near that at the moment, but there are sufficient examples of schemes that do bits of that for me to be convinced that that is possible. And a really important question to ask whenever you're approaching a new project is what solutions already exist in this place? The ancient Persians knew how to make ice in the desert using entirely passive ingenious means thousands of years ago. And if you compare that with the kind of things that European architects are designing in Dubai, you, know, you could start to question the whole idea of progress, but you know, let's not go there at the moment. Uh, but more, more positively, I think we're going to see the most amazing reawakening of ingenuity because the fossil fuel age has been a distraction from that. We are an ingenious species, and that is a, a, an exciting thing to look forward to. And then if we also, still with this question, what solutions exist in this place, and sticking with deserts, you could look at the biological organisms that have adapted to life there. <clears throat> so for instance, you, you could learn from plants with spines that literally suck water out of the air against gravity. You could learn from lizards that can drink with their feet using capillary grooves on their skin. You could look at beetles that have evolved condensation surfaces on, on their shells. You could look at camel's nostrils, which are a, a miracle of water recovery engineering. All of these exist for us to learn from, and ideally, we would look at both the, the human examples and the biological examples without a dualistic separation and just see them as a totality of evolved ingenuity that we can draw from. So what will this look like? Well, I think we will see a lot more plants incorporated into buildings. I'm not a big fan of trees on buildings. Uh, some architects got a bit carried away with those. Uh, <laughs> but there is a good case for this, for incorporating more habitats, for creating uh, microclimatic benefits. And I think one of the biggest changes we'll see will be in the spaces between buildings. This is in Seoul, in South Korea. This used to be covered by a six-lane motorway. The mayor persuaded people to tear this down and restore this river, and it's become this wonderful linear park. It's even reduced temperatures in that part of the city by about six degrees. And this also touches on the idea of biophilia, the, the theory that because we evolved in direct contact with nature, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we are happier, healthier, and more productive if we're in regular contact with nature. So in hospitals, it's been shown that people with a view of nature will recover 8% more quickly and need half the amount of pain-relieving drugs. So uh, another really crucial feature, I think, of regenerative cities will be um, 
treating them as ecosystem models. And what I mean by that is um, think, thinking of each element of the city as the equivalent of a species and thinking of those resource flows and trying to get arrange it so that the waste from one part of the system becomes the nutrient for something else in that system. And this has been done um, in some cities. This is uh, an extension to Stockholm. And uh, in the Sahara Forest Project, we've actually taken that a lot further. So this was a scheme that brought together a number of technologies in synergistic ways. The core technologies were forms of solar energy, a seawater cooled greenhouse, and desert revegetation. And one of the most interesting synergies was that the shade created by the mirrors and solar panels made it possible to grow a whole range of crops underneath that would not normally grow in desert regions. So we built a version of this, we tested it, this allowed us to explore all the different elements of the system and to bring in one or two other technologies. That was it on site. And um, it was opened during the climate change talks in 2012. We managed to grow cucumbers throughout the summer months with half the amount of fresh water of conventional approaches. And this uh, shows what we were trying to achieve. So the, the green icons are the, the technologies uh, that we were bringing into the synergistic cluster. And in simple terms, we were using what we had a lot of, sunlight, seawater, and carbon dioxide, to produce more of the things we need. And the whole thing ran on solar energy. We brought seawater in, in various places. Carbon dioxide was absorbed in these places. And then we uh, tried to treat every bit of underutilized resource uh, as a, an input for something else. And I don't have time to go through all those connections. And sometimes when I show this to people, they think, oh my God, that looks hellishly complicated. And yes, in a way it is. But I think it's the kind of complexity that we need to embrace. And it's getting easier to do this. So in my office, we developed a little model that makes it easier to design for these. So this allows you to input technologies, connect up their resource flows. It shows you anything that's underutilized. That's an opportunity to add something to the system that creates more value. And then you can press play and you can see how it works. And you can even test for resilience. So you could cut one of these links. And if the whole thing goes into breakdown, then that's a sign that you need to add further duplication or buffering or redundancy to that system. And with digital tools like this, we should be able to get closer and closer to the densely interconnected, regenerative, productive systems in biology. And uh, alongside uh, twiddling the knobs on the technologies, we made a note of what was happening with the biodiversity. There was literally nothing there at the beginning, and uh, we made note of any mammals, birds, and insects that appeared. So first things were flies, nothing particularly interesting there. The same day we brought the first plants to site, we had the first birds, Soon after that, we had the first insects, so initially grasshoppers, crickets, and then a month later, butterflies. And this was quite amazing, really, because we're a long way from the, the nearest patch of planting. So it does seem as though nature has an amazing capacity to regenerate if you can create the right conditions. Uh, then, uh, as the plants got more established, more birds, that was a wagtail, more insects. Um, then we had rats, uh, which were a bit of a pain. Uh, but never mind, um, more insects. Um, then we had uh, mice to deal with, which is um, even more of a pain. But never mind, more birds, more insects, mice. Um, three days after the algae ponds were filled, we had the first dragonflies. And again, I don't know where they came from, because this was a long way from the nearest dragonfly habitat. Uh, then we had an appearance from a feral cat, which is nice because the number of rats and mice started going down. Uh, more insects, more birds, rare bird, hoopo, uh, rufous tailed shrikes. Um, I'm not actually a birder, so if I get these wrong, tell me. Um, and then eventually uh, we had the first indigenous mammal. It's got a, a jaboa. It, it leaves very distinctive tracks, like a little hopping kangaroo. Uh, so all that was achieved in just eight months on a site 100 meters by 100 meters. And I'm absolutely convinced that if we were to do that on a larger scale, over a longer time scale, that regenerative effect would be even more pronounced. And each time I work with these system models, I like to improve them. Um, and recently we've been working with some academics who've studied lots of human examples of these ecosystems using the same tools that you would analyze actual ecosystems with. And they, they found some, some really interesting, uh, they've drawn some really interesting conclusions. One is that the, the, the larger the number and diversity of species, or equivalent of species, the more resource efficient it becomes. And also, in human-made systems, the equivalent of detritivores are very much underrepresented. 
And by detritivores, I mean all the organisms like fungi and microorganisms and worms and insects and, and, and so on in the soil, the great molecular dismantlers of nature. Uh, um, they, they are very much underrepresented. The equivalent of those in human-made systems would be the repairers, recyclers, and, and upcyclers. And um, I think there's scope here for a whole new section of, of our economy. Uh, I'd, I would call these resource alchemists, actually. Uh, so what we've done now is a, a slightly more sophisticated model where we're trying to get a better sense of the system boundary, the energy coming in from various sources, the CO2 emitted and absorbed. And initially, we've just got three things. We've got industry, housing, and agriculture. And then we can add in some, some solar energy, connect that up. And um, if you look at some of the figures of things going in and out, you'll see that the the inputs are reducing and the underutilized resources are, are also reducing. And that's what we're aiming for. You know, linear flows are degenerative, cyclical flows are regenerative. So then the next thing is that we can add in a um, agrivoltaic, so that's agriculture under uh, solar energy, which delivers sort of multiple uh, secondary benefits. And um, then the next thing is, um, Wastewater, so instead of losing all the nutrients from the system, if we establish a wastewater system within the system boundary that is using plants and microorganisms, that maintains the nutrients, it saves water, and it restores biodiversity. And that can connect up to the housing and uh, the, the industry. Then, um, how are we doing? Well, the um, amount of CO2 emitted is going down, the amount of CO2 absorbed um, is going up. Uh, there's still masses of sunlight to make use of. And what you can do with these systems is you, is you can just keep tinkering with them. And, and there's, there's still plenty of biodegradable waste which we can use for a biodigester. The waste, the CO2 from that could be used in greenhouses. And essentially you can just keep on going with these systems. And uh, the, the more that you, you work with them, the more uh, diverse and productive they become. And, and so when I say... Ultimately, we have to integrate everything we do as humans into the web of life. This is a very practical example of, of how we do that. Uh, this is a further element. This is, uh, there's some um, fish lakes on site. We can use some of the uh, food streams to make fish food for those, and that further reduces the amount of food that we're having to bring into the system. And eventually, we will get to the point where we are creating and dealing with everything within that system. So now, uh, moving on to longer now, which I, I, I'm just going to touch on briefly. Uh, so this um, comes from Brian Eno's idea of a big here and a long now. And we actually refer to Brian's ideas in several places in the book. And one of the recurring things in the book is about trying to identify uh, maladaptive frames and propose regenerative frames. So we know from cognitive neuroscience that the worldviews or frames or metaphors that we hold have a major bearing on the way we see the world and the way we behave as a result. So as an example, we've all heard that time is money. We've heard that repeated so often that it's developed a kind of air of uh, unarguable truth about it. Uh, and it, often it takes a more persuasive story to dislodge an existing one. And the best one, I think, comes from Karma Shatim, the, the head of the Gross National Happiness project in Bhutan, who said, no, time is life. And if you think for a moment about the difference in behavior that that would, that would produce, imagine a, a national leader or a business leader who subscribed to the idea that time is money. It would seem natural to them to exploit people. Um, whereas if you subscribe to the idea that time is money, sorry, time is life. Did I just get that the wrong, wrong way around? Time, if you think time is money, it would seem natural to exploit people. Whereas if you subscribe to the view that time is life, I think you're much more likely to respect people and also to ask more deeper questions about how you want to spend your own precious time on Earth. I prefer this to the Earthrise photo. This was taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it passed Jupiter, it turned around and took this photograph of planet Earth. And it makes me think about just how isolated we are. It also makes me think about our place in deep time and, and the cosmos. And Janine Bainey is, is very good at getting across a, a sense of deep time. And what she encourages you to do is to uh, 
There we go. Um, if you consider, just imagine Earth's history, the whole history of Earth were represented as a single calendar year, and you were a breath before midnight looking back over that year, then what you'd find is that the first life forms appeared in March. Oh, it seems to have got stuck. Here we go. No, no. The dinosaurs appeared in, in mid-December, and uh, they disappeared on Boxing Day. I, I have worked that out. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know what's this, this got in, sort of stuck in a loop somehow. Ah, there we go. Okay. The first hominids appeared at 8 p.m. today, the 31st of December. That's how young we are as a species. The whole of recorded history has flashed past in the last 30 seconds. In the last third of a second, that's the time I've been alive, we have driven more than two-thirds of the non-human animal biomass into oblivion. And it would be very easy to think that uh, we're hurtling towards extinction. And if we carry on as we are, we will be. But in that last third of a second, we've also developed phenomenal science. We've mastered solar energy. And what we do in the next tenth of a second will determine, to a large extent, the future of humanity and planet Earth. So I think this really helps us to think about our place in time and to, to accept the fact that we're quite a young species still trying to get things right, and also to drive home the urgency that we do that. One of our main sources in this chapter is Roman Krasnarek, whose excellent book, The Good Ancestor, I'd recommend to all of you. And he describes examples of long-term thinking and cathedral thinking, by which he means projects that, that you start, that one generation might start, in the full knowledge that they may not be complete for many generations hence. And these are perhaps more common than you might think. So the Ise Shrine in Japan, that's been rebuilt every 20 years for over 1,500 years. The polder system in the Netherlands has been managed in the same system pretty much for about 500 years. And of course, there are plenty of cathedrals that have taken hundreds of years to build. And most people, like myself, who've been working in sustainability, will have had the experience of developing solutions that are way better in the medium to long term, such as that textile factory, which had a payback period of just five or six years. And beyond that, it would be virtually free to run. And we're constantly told, well, you know, the, the um, economics don't make sense. The economics only don't make sense because we're, we've been restricted to very short-term perspectives. But thankfully, there are now plenty of people challenging those economic models and challenging the way that we've identified ourselves as, as you know, utility maximizers and um, consumers. I, I think future generations will regard that as utterly bizarre. Another important source for this chapter is Jay Griffiths, whose wonderful book, Pip Pip, is a really lyrical description of time. And she talks about um, how arrogant it is for people in the West to refer to the time. Well, it would be much more accurate and respectful to refer to a time, because there are, there are plenty of others. And uh, a lot of indigenous peoples have um, lived for thousands of years with a, a cyclical idea of time. They're thoroughly attuned to daily, so solar, lunar cycles, <coughs> seasonal cycles, and annual cycles. And it's actually much better for us as people in terms of our human health. So in this project, we, we set out to design it as far as possible to be entirely naturally lit. And that's only partly for the energy savings. It's much more about reconnecting with biology, about reconnecting with circadian rhythms, because the color and brightness of daylight varies over the course of each day. And it's better for you, you sleep better if you're connected with that. So we looked at a whole array of biological organisms that, that gather and distribute light in interesting ways. Uh, examples like the, the spookfish, uh, mussels have beautiful eyes. This is a rainforest plant. This is a much uh, underappreciated elephant nose fish. Uh, and these hold amazing secrets that we can learn from as designers. Now, another aspect of time uh, that Roman Krasnarek talks about is, is the way that the first clocks told just the um, hour, then the minute, um, after that, uh, the, the, uh, it showed seconds. And by the end of last century, a lot of financial trading was based on microseconds. So that kind of compartmentalized linear sense of time does affect the way we think about things. And I think if you can uh, reconnect with psychical ideas of time, um, it would actually be much better for you. Um, so 
I think that linear sense of time also encourages the view that the past is finished and the future hasn't begun and is something that happens to us. Recently, I went to a lecture by Cecilia Pardo. She was the curator for the Peru exhibition at the British Museum. And she showed this amazing diagram of how the Nazca people viewed time. So they had this idea of parallel time in which past, present, and future was in constantly un unfolding together. And the more I think about this, the more it makes sense to me. Because this encourages you to think about history as, as an open book subject. And to think that actually it's never too late to correct some of the past injustices. And this also affects the way we see the future. Because the, the future that unfolds is um, very much dependent on the kind of ideas that, that we, um, we promote. And here I'm, I'm going to quote from Brian Eno because he captures this brilliantly. He says that um, humans are capable of a unique trick, creating realities by first imagining them, by experiencing them in their minds. When Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, he was inviting others to dream it with him. Once a dream becomes shared in that way, current reality gets measured against it and then modified towards it. As soon as we sense the possibility of a more desirable world, we begin behaving differently, as though that world is starting to come into existence, as though, in our minds at least, we are already there. The dream becomes an invisible force which pulls us forward. By this process, it starts to come true. The act of imagining something makes it real. And that, I, th I think, is, is also embodied very well in this idea uh, about the future. And so what you can see there is that the way we think about time does affect our view of the world and our sense of agency. And a final example uh, on time before I draw together some conclusions. The ancient Greeks had two different types of time, Kronos and Kairos. So Kronos was conventional um, chronological time. Kairos was opportune time, when it's much more feasible to bring about change. And in the built environment, a great example of this is the first workshop you have on a project. And often these are very energizing. You have the whole team there. There's a real sense in which anything is possible. And you brainstorm these ideas in a very energetic way. And that's the point at which is really important to use ideas of long-term thinking, to set the ambitions really high so that those remain for the, for the rest of the project. Because that is a fleeting moment. And that's the time to really maximize your agency. So I said I'd return uh, briefly to Architects Declare. Um, so this now um, has a fantastic steering group full of very energetic, committed people. We've expanded this across disciplines and we've made it as easy as possible for other countries to set up um, the same. So we now have over 7,000 companies signed up to a declaration of action in 28 countries. And in the UK, we've been striving to, to really bring about uh, change at the kind of paradigm level, making the case for regenerative design in the way we wrote the declaration points and in the events that we hold. We've also uh, been working to try and change the mission of the RIBA, so changing the, the kind of deep purpose of the profession, and to redefine what it means to be avant-garde. And now uh, we're, we're also in discussions with some of the other declare groups, because there are a lot of these, heritage declares, culture declares, music declares, and more than two thirds of the local authorities in the UK have declared a climate emergency. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of those groups have come to the same conclusion, which is that there's only so much we can do to get our own houses in order. Ultimately, we need large scale systems change. And a lot of what I've been talking about it's really a sort of broadening of perspectives. So if you look at the way that humanities evolved, initially there was an individualistic mindset that turned into a tribal one, a national one, an international one. And now we need to move into a planetary perspective where we see everything as interconnected and as our well-being as being inseparable from the well-being of the life systems on which we depend. And there are other shifts as well, such as the shift from seeing ourselves as subjects to consumers to conscious consumers and then to citizens. And since finishing the book with Sarah, I've been getting more and more interested in spiral dynamics, uh, which I think captures a lot of these uh, human shifts. And um, this is a kind of meta theory, so it's based on a lot of different, um, a lot of similar theories from different parts of the world. And there seems to be 
quite a strong consensus that humanity has passed through a number of distinct stages. And where we are now is that we seem to be kind of stuck in a culture war between stages blue, orange, and green. So blue is the traditional phase, um, orange is the modernist um, phase, and the time when the market is dominated. Green is uh, the sort of conscious consumer phase where, uh, of social and environmental <clears throat> activism and so on. And what we really need to do is to, to move into the second tier. Uh, the, and the yellow one is called the integrative meme. <coughs> and whereas in the first tier, there's a lot of antagonism, antagonism between all the, the different perspectives, in the second tier, it's much easier to look back on all those previous stages and to draw out the best aspects of each. And the ultimate would be to reach the, the sort of turquoise holistic meme and to look at the totality of, of the biosphere and the ethnosphere and just draw out the best aspects from each to address our current challenges. And the person I think who's doing that most successfully at the moment is Jeremy Lent, who's now working on the third part of his, his trilogy. And uh, to finish off now, what I hope you've seen is that it, I think it is possible to overcome this um, dualistic separation from nature. And as an ind ingenious species, we really ought to be able to do uh, the same as, as certain um, uh, other species can do. You know, this is the difference that a single pair of beavers can make to a fire-ravaged landscape. We have to get to the point where we are uh, interacting and co-evolving with the rest of nature to the point where we're actually having a, a net positive impact. And this is eminently achievable. This is 9,000 square kilometers of restored landscape. That was barren desert, now restored to a lush landscape. And thinking about that spiral dynamic shift, I think a number of people are already in that second tier meme. They're realizing the shortcomings of conventional sustainability. And I know this might sound like a grand statement, but I, I actually think we need a kind of transformation of human consciousness to really address the planetary emergency. And if that sounds daunting, then just look at the prize that's on offer. In our cities, we could create the most fantastic quality of life with clean air and healthy food, an abundance of, of shared facilities, a public luxury of shared facilities. In our landscapes, we could, we could be the first generation to witness the great return, the return of salmon runs to our rivers, the return of flora and fauna to our forests. Instead of accelerating extinctions, our silent spring could segue into a raucous summer as we increasingly inhabit a new role for us as humans, a new role as co-enablers of the flourishing of all life for all time. Thank you. climate change, green transition, I always get depressed. But I think <laughs> yours, I, I'm well, sure thank you. we're feeling a little bit more positive. And this is I, I just need to credit that line about Silent Spring to Rock of Summer to George Monbiot. It would have been a bit cumbersome if I'd done it in the midst of that. But <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic line and it comes from his TED talk. Great, yeah, no, I mean, I'm feeling very positive. There's this minor obstacles called human beings, but <laughs> despite of that, yeah. So, um, no, and I'm also very happy you mentioned that, uh, you know, the economics framework in the question of uh, uh, understanding human beings as utility maximizers. I can see many of my students here, and that's what we do every Monday morning is to challenge that. And I hope all of you got some inspirations uh, from from my. Uh, from, uh. But anyway, okay. So, uh, Katie, <laughs> the floor is yours. Move the mic Thank you very much, Michael, for that um, hugely inspiring and illuminating um, presentation. Um, I didn't know what you were going to present on before I made, made my remarks. I'm kind of taking my lead from your book and the five, is it five? Five paradigms yeah. that you outline, mindset shifts okay. that need to happen um, amongst humanity in order to um, not trash the planet within the vanishingly small time frame we have left, not to do that. Um, and 
I guess like, well, as a starting point at IIPP, we're very much about shifting paradigms. So yeah. um, I really, I could see a lot of parallels with the work that I do from an ecological economics perspective. And I think some of the regenerative design principles you outline, sp specifically from this complex systems, biomimicry, kind of drawing from nature, yeah. there are a lot of parallels with the kind of the underlying philo philosophy of ecological economics and what it's yes. trying to achieve. So yeah. um, I learned a lot from, um, from the concrete examples you gave and um, in particular what what I most love about your book and um, some of the other talks that I've, I've um, seen you do on YouTube is that ultimately you're providing a much more robust definition of what sustainability should be. Um, I think all too often we take green as anything that's you know a tiny bit better than the status quo and that yes. is um, it's insufficient as a a kind of um, definition of success. Um, your definition of regenerative as uh, supporting the flourishing of all life all of the time um, is gives us so much more traction to then evaluate uh, policy solutions or, or, or corporate behaviours on the basis of, okay, so where are they on that trajectory to yeah. achieving that? And um, that I think we need to see so much more um, in yeah green action and sustainability around the society. Um, so um, I'm, a, I'm an economist, um, I'm particularly focused on political economy, so please take my, my comments with, uh, with that in mind. <laughs> um, I think um, what I really valued in your, in your book is the, the, the attention you pay to the fact that language matters, the ontological framing of what we're talking about matters, and um, I think too often in sustainability uh, circles and green policy making, the underlying philosophy is neglected at its peril. Yeah. And this, this um, you know, Cartesian duality between uh, nature and society, which you articulate, I think is central to a lot of the problems we see today. And I, I see it in my own work in green finance. Um, to give you one example uh, of the, uh, an on the ground consequence of this dualistic separation of society from nature, Carbon credits. Um, so, you know, the idea that you can sell uh, a carbon offset, yeah. um, which allows a corporation to essentially strike an, an environmental liability off its balance sheet. What is the consequence of that? You know, um, some uh, local community in the global south normally has its land taken off them and you have deleterious social consequences coming from that. Yeah. And I think um, this, is the, this is the importance of philosophy, essentially. Um, so your overarching conclusion that you know, the obstacles to our problem are not technological or financial, they are social and political, I think is key here. And um, my, my comments are very much going to interrogate the, the political economy dimensions of your vision. I That's think. not my strong suit. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm, I don't think you need to respond to them so much, but I think what, what, I, see, what I see is that I think there are, there are lots of, um, there's lots of parallel work going on here, and I feel like there's lots of avenues for, sure. for future conversations on this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so uh, that was a very long preamble. But my, my first comment is on um, cities and urban planning and, and relating this to the role of the state, which is very much um, the focus of IIPP's work. Um, so um, in your book, you give some great examples of you know, how cities are very much at the vanguard of this regenerative design. And there are so many amazing examples around the world of, of cities doing great stuff. Yeah. And obviously cities are really important. Half of the world's population lives in cities and that's only going to grow. Um, however, my provocation is that you know, cities themselves are not closed systems, right? They, um, they exist within globalised supply chains. Um, metabolically speaking, they're drawing on... Uh, and they are kind of extracting into natures in, in far-flung locations, um, right? And we, we kind of have this push towards localization of production in some areas, but um, ultimately, you know, if something is produced by coal and with cheap labour in China, that's, that's ultimately going to end up on our, on our supermarket shelves and what people produce, right? So, um, and likewise, on the flip side, the, 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 the ability of a, a city or a region to actually invest in in the kind of regenerative ideas you're talking about is very much dependent on the political autonomy and the, the kind of fiscal space they're given by by uh, national governments but also by the international context um, especially in the global south where you have economies which are completely subordinated to kind of the whims of the international system uh, that's a slightly separate question anyway my question is um 
Have you come across any examples where um, kind of regenerative design principles have been successfully scaled up beyond cities to kind of broader regions or even national scales? Um, and if not, what, what is the, the paradigm blockage, as it were, according to the kind of five paradigms that, that you've laid out? Laid out? And um, related to that, you know, what, what is the role of the state in your vision? Um, I think a, a lot of what you're speaking about in your book, it kind of relates to this kind of very forward thinking urban planning perspective. Um, you know, scaling that up to the role of the state, are we, are we talking about a return to a more centralized, if ultimately democratized planning state? Um, and relatedly, um, you know, we do a lot of work here at IAPP about the dynamic capabilities of, of the state and policymakers. Um, in being able to deliver transformative change. So, you know, what, what are the kinds of specific capacities that policymakers need to develop in order to kind of implement um, these regenerative outcomes? And I'm talking not only just of tools, uh, uh, but also, you know, specific policies and institutions that might need to be developed. That's quite a broad question, but I'd be interested to hear about any examples that you've, you've had with interacting with policymakers. Um, my, my next few questions are a little bit more gloomy. Um, <laughs> I've got a goldfish memory. Shall I respond to that first? Yeah, you can go for that one first. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks. There's, there's a lot in that. Um, so other examples of how this has been scaled up to regions. Well, I, I'm not aware of any particularly good ones. Um, I think Puran Desai of Bioregional is doing some of the most interesting work on this. So he was part of the, the team that designed that housing project I mentioned at the beginning. It was built back in 2009. And his organisation, Bioregional, is, is very much about trying to uh, bring our resource use back into bioregions. And in terms of blockages, well, I think it's partly um, a, perhaps a concern that localization might mean kind of a form of parochialism. And I actually think that's a very easy conundrum to solve because you just need to distinguish between different types of resources. And what we need to be doing is localizing our physical resource and maximizing, sorry, localizing our physical resource and globalizing our intellectual resources. And in the book, we give an example of bamboo. And there are bam species of bamboo in just about every tropical and semi-tropical country. So you could use a local species, but then you could share the knowledge globally about how to use that in the most effective way. And um, I think you, you were asking to, how this might be brought about and does it need uh, sort of quite careful planning and, and so on. And I think one of the really exciting things about those system models is that to a large extent, they are kind of emergent and self-organizing. So one of the classic examples is in um, Denmark, it's called Kalundborg, and it's, it's actually an industrial estate where the industries have co-located and, and shared resources and so on. And that was nearly all self-organizing. So a lot, of the, a lot of it can happen in that emergent way. The kind of national policies that would really promote it would be shifting taxation away from labor more towards the use of resources, because that would immediately reward those that, who are more inventive with um, using resources more efficiently and uh, transforming waste into value. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, again, chiming very much with um, a lot of policy recommendations that stem from ecological economics. Um, okay, so um, my next uh, few questions are more gloomy because um, they bring in the C word, uh, which is capitalism. <laughs> um, and um, I, I, I sort of felt I needed to bring this in. Um, I know a lot of people don't like talking about capitalism. Um, and I, I take, you know, I see that you're an architect. It's not, it's not your area. That's fine. Um, but I think it's important um, because, you know, the paradigm shifts you're talking about. So moving past this idea of time as money, uh, moving past the nature society dichotomy, moving past growth dependency, most importantly, you know, these stri strike me as profoundly uh, in conflict with the central processes of capital accumulation which drive you know our, our global economy and um, you know the, the 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 great chapter you had on the, the longer now and this idea we need to bring back cathedral thinking um, you know this is blocked by um, the time value of money which is a central dictum of capitalism so long-term projects struggle to happen in our system because um, you know we apply a discount rate 
to uh, long-term benefits. So the further something out is in the future, the, the smaller the benefit appears from our, from our point now. Yeah. And I agree with you, this is absolutely something we need, we need to get beyond. Um, the question is, how do we do this? Um, and I think um, you might, I don't know whether you've come across it or whether you mention it in the book, but um, there's a huge body of work um, under the umbrella term political ecology, um, which has done some great stuff incorporating uh, an analysis of capitalist processes into what you call the web of life. And uh, Jason Moore is the academic who's, who's written a great book on this. And, and, and central to his thesis is that um, capitalism, to a certain extent, manufactures and is ultimately sustained by what he calls cheap nature. So extractive nature rather than regenerative yeah. relations with nature. Um, you know, so from this perspective, the, the move to a, to a regenerative form of interacting with nature rather than an extractive one is actually fundamentally incompatible with the logic of how capitalism works because it, it relies on it, right? Um, I think more, more relevant to, to, to what we're talking about here, what I'm interested in is how focusing on capitalism is kind of almost critical from a, a, an analytical strategic leverage point, if that makes sense, in order to locate the sources of power which might act as obstacles to what we're, we're trying to achieve in terms of implementing this vision. Um, and um, uh, Carolina will like me for bringing this up, but um, there's been some great work done by uh, Samir Amin, um, dependency theorist, who um, he came up with this idea that we live uh, under um, monopoly capitalism. So this idea that there are a limited number of people in limited geographies around the world who have more or less mono monopoly control over our natural resources, our financial resources, uh, military power, technology and media. And um, the significance of this is that, you know, this kind of quite small group of people actually form a really powerful political blockage um, because the status quo very much works for them. And, um, you know, we, we always hear the countless examples of, you know, corporations actively obstructing uh, efforts to kind of implement the, the projects that you're talking about. Um, you know, the power of agribusiness in Brazil is, you know, one of, one of the many examples. Um, so my question here is, you know, what do we have to do to achieve these paradigm shifts in the context of a world dominated by the multinational corporation as potentially one of the uh, as potentially a, a source of power that is as significant as the nation state or the city um so to, to put some numbers on this uh, and linking this back to our last seminar talk um, given by uh, ben brown uh, blackrock uh, which is a global asset manager the largest one in the world has, an, has assets under ma management of 10 trillion US dollars, um, which is several times larger than the GDP of an, the entire African continent, for example. Um, and obviously, these, these, these pressures don't just exist at a global level, but also at um, local, local urban scales. Um, so coming back to your, your concept of um, symbiogenesis, which I, which I really liked, um, I think what, what struck me most when I was kind of reading about this um, this idea of understanding um, processes of mutual uh, or building processes for mutual benefit and cooperation. The first thing that sprang to my mind was um, housing cooperatives and, you know, the kind of potential they have to kind of um, accelerate uh, sustainability and sustainable building. Um, but bringing this back to kind of the kind of capitalist dynamics, um, housing cooperatives are in many regions in the world constantly under threat from the kind of commercial profit driven um, pressures of the, the rentier class um, and you know in countries like the UK rentier capitalism kind of almost is, is a major obstacle to, to really scaling up these cooperative models so my, my overarching question here is um, you know how how can these mindset shifts kind of override this very systemic structural drive for profit? Um, or what kind of, is there more intervention that's needed to kind of break up these, these political coalitions to ultimately bring about these visions? And I realise that's a big question. Uh, but <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it's, it's a important question. to ask. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah, sure, no, it's a really knotty one. And, and... Absolutely. There's a huge amount of resistance to change and some very powerful players who are doing that. So it's not an easy question to answer. But I think it will come about ultimately through public pressure. And I think the, you know, the idea of long-term investing being fundamentally at odds with 
capitalism. Um, I mean, I think there there are some examples of, of where that is that has to change very soon. So, for instance, there's we include the figure in the book. I think it's something like one and a half trillion dollars in invested in pension funds around the world. Now, if uh, if we experience widespread ecological collapses, uh, then a lot of that money is going to be worth far less. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, a lot of those insurance companies are now starting to get on board. It was interesting to see that the Financial Times recently joined Business Declares a Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, and a number of big insurance players are now part of that group as well. Uh, but to address that question a bit more about, you know, how do we change these really big players? I, um, I think it's, it's only really going to come about if we, if we make very high level systems changes. And the most promising one that I can think of is the Wellbeing Group of Governments, which was initiated three years ago by Scotland, Iceland and New Zealand. Who, and they, you know, they, they just decided that we've had enough of maximizing GDP as, as the purpose of our economy. It's, 50 years ago, JFK gave that inspiring speech about how absurd that is, and yet it's taken us this long. Mm -hmm. So as a group, they were then joined by Wales and Finland. And what I hope is that that group will continue to grow and eventually eclipse the kind of boys club that is the, the G20, which is kind of insanely growth obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, and I mean, I think that you know the whole topic of, of growth do, does require um, a, a, a kind of fuller discussion. And while I admire a lot of the things about the, the degrowth manifesto, and Jason Hickel's book Less Is More is absolutely brilliant, I think the framing of it is problematic. And um, that point's already been made by George Lakoff, who, who said that it's like when you say, "Don't think of an elephant." It, that it's very difficult not to think of an elephant. If you, if you say degrowth, it makes people think of growth. And, and so that's why in our chapter, we propose that maximizing planetary health was a, a much better aim. And of course, that's, that's already underway. You know, that the um, Planetary Health Alliance was launched by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet magazine. Uh, and I think, I think that's a really promising kind of tier two spirodynamics um, development <coughs> and of course there are growing uh, schools of economic thought that are aligning with planetary limits as well so you know how quickly it's going to happen i really don't know but what i do know for, for sure is uh, that a lot of those big players are increasingly uncomfortable i thought it would have happened sooner uh, because about 20 years ago i went to a small debate um that was held near Parliament Square. And there was a, a recently retired, very senior person from an oil company. And they can employ decent lawyers. So I'm not going to say which oil company it was. <laughs> um, and this was just after the Kyoto Protocol had been signed and so on. And he said, the reason we're taking action on climate change is because we don't want to be tried in the future as mass murderers. And I was staggered at the language he was using. <laughs> that, is, that, that is a verbatim quote. And I thought, wow, well, you know, clearly we're on the cusp of change. And then for whatever reason, it seemed that the oil companies decided that they just wanted to extract as much money during the twilight years of that industry as, as they could. But we know for sure that they're aware of these things and they must be getting less and less comfortable. And, and we need to increase that. We need to dial up that pressure. Absolutely. I've got one more. I've got time for me. We have 10 minutes left. Oh, okay. No, I'll leave it. It's still going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. No, thank you, Katie. That was a fantastic intervention. Um, and I think you went very well. <laughs> so, yeah, we are open to questions from the audience. Um, and uh, Josh, when you feel you want to step in with some questions from people online. But, yeah, so we have one there. Can I get a woman first? <laughs> Um, so I'd just be interested to know, what's your view on this um, sustainable city that the Saudis are proposing in the middle of the desert? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, given you know, they are the ultimate fossil fuel power, um, are they looking at, at a sustainable future as, the, as their fossil fuel days are drawing to a close? Mm. <laughs> 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 Oh dear. Well, I mean, the, the only positive thing I could say about that is, is that 
I think it's quite c courageous to design a city completely without private cars, and, and that's interesting. Uh, the rest of it is a nightmare on just about every level. Human mm -hmm. rights, uh, the whole attitude towards nature, you know, the idea that you'd have these massively high stories as a c continuous line through the landscape. Um, no, I, I, I don't think it's a promising development. I think it's uh, massively driven by um, ego and image. So, so no, sorry, I don't think that's a positive example. Uh, there, there was a, a more positive example in the Middle East um, called Mazdar um, in Abu Dhabi that was designed quite a while ago. That, that was a much more holistic approach to designing for sustainable slash regenerative cities. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, I, I, uh, I, I worked for the labor movement before I hung out around here, and I gave a, a series of lectures about this subject, about climate and so forth, uh, talking about the need to move it very fast because time was running out. And I came to listen to you and felt somewhat skeptical, but I came to profoundly agree with what you were saying about the end game, mm -hmm. right? But I wanted to challenge you about something very specific about your presentation, which is, and I don't know if you can bring this slide up, but you had a slide of the, of the experiment that you did in the desert with the solar, with the solar panels and the, and the the crops that grew underneath and so forth. Yeah. And I wanted you to talk about the issue of how the material, that just look at that slide and think about the materials that produced, that we used to produce that experiment, right? The, the aluminum, the steel, the electronics, uh, and how those materials were produced. And the challenge that that fact presents to the paradigm that you're setting up, right? What, where and what are the steel mills, the aluminum smelters, the open cast mines, uh, the heavy equipment that digs the bauxite? Yeah, yeah. That well, I, I know, I'm with you. <laughs> 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 Matt, can you what, what do we do about that? Sure. Just hold on, we're gonna get one more there and then we'll go online. <clears throat> okay, um, it was touching on what you were saying earlier about economics and the future of capitalism, but I know in the book Flourish it talks about donut, donut economics yeah. and by Kate Rainsworth, which is a lovely idea, which I think ties in so well with your uh, regenerative idea, and it's just ha the question is simply how well is that getting taken up by the wider sort of economy and public and mindset is changing. Yeah. Okay. Michael, we have five minutes left, so if we can address two, two minutes and a half, then we have another round. Just a blank combined question with that. Okay, so have a Is that, um, where is the area where humans should not intervene? Like, you know, we're talking a lot about intervention. Is it just that, you know, is there something that we should just leave to <laughs> nature and not do anything? Yeah, all right. Should I address yeah, please, this? Yeah, yeah. All right, so the solar above agriculture. So that, that's called agrivoltaics. Um, first of all, I, I want to make the case for why that is such a transformative model, because in places like in sub-Saharan Africa, where um, it's very dry and hot and the, the growing season is very short, those actually massively extend the growing season and, and offer all sorts of secondary benefits. So it's a fundamental shift from a quite a patriarchal centralized fossil fuel energy system to a much more uh, democratized uh, energy system that is more productive in terms of agriculture, uses less water, restores the soil, sequesters carbon in the soil, enhances biodiversity. So the starting point is good. To address your point about materials, yes, it does take aluminium and, and steel, but I would challenge your the implication in your question that it is impossible or we should move away from mining. We're going to need quite possibly more mining over the next 20, 30 years to actually achieve this transition. And funny enough, I've been working with one of the big mining companies, might surprise you, uh, but th this particular one are actually very serious about moving to a regenerative model of getting to the point where a, a lot of the mining is done underground, so there's minimal um, disruption to the surface. Uh, they've got very um, uh, bold decarbonisation plans, <coughs> they're very into the whole 
um, ecosystem model and, and biometric thinking, and their aim is to be able to leave the, the, the site in a far better state than it was at the beginning, socially, environmentally, and economically. So um, I, uh, I think uh, it is possible to, to produce aluminium and steel in regenerative ways, and I do think that is a good model. So donut economics, um, yeah, it's a, a fantastic and wonderfully clear model. And um, Kate is a fantastically inspiring uh, speaker and advocate for the idea. And uh, as far as I'm aware, she's going great guns. Um, yeah, Amsterdam is um, uh, implementing it in a, in a really serious way. And I think there's going to be more information about that later next year. And I know that they've had approaches from loads of other um, cities. Um, in Architects Declare, we're going to be making the case for the London Mayor to implement uh, donut economics as well. So I think that's that's all very positive. Mm -hmm. that's good. The question about where should humans not intervene? Well, <clears throat> I think it's probably worth articulating it's di different kind of approaches to nature. You know, one approach that you could call as the sustainable approach is where you, you would do a little ecological survey and then you try and make some improvements relative to that baseline. That's quite weak. Another approach would be you start with the assumption that humans are inherently bad and, and the best thing that we can do is exclude humans and let nature recover. And there is a certain strand of the rewilding world that thinks about it that way. Uh, but I think there's a much more positive and inspiring vision, which is one that we talk about in the book that comes from a philosopher called Freya Matthews, who talks about the idea of conativity. And what she's referring to there is the way that organisms the species have actually evolved not just to maximize their own existence, but to maximize the existence of the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And for too long now, we've been in this sustainable mindset that thinks the best we can aspire to is to be less bad. Less bad across everything. Maybe if we can be 100% less bad, you know, we'll get there, whatever there means. And there are plenty of examples from indigenous peoples where they have inhabited a certain area and the way they've interacted with that landscape has resulted in a, in a much richer level of biodiversity mm -hmm. than where they have not been. So it is possible for humans to get to a point where we are participating, co-evolving as nature and having a net positive impact. Mm -hmm. Like Les Ram, Josh, do you want to? Yeah, I've got a couple of uh, questions from, we've got like 30, 40 people online. Uh, oh, I'm going to ask, <laughs> uh, ask you one, I think. Um, around 2.5 billion more people will be living in cities by 2050. In Nigeria alone, more than 180 million people will be added to urban areas in that period. What's your view of the urbanisation challenge in contexts like this, where the scale and complexity of the problem is way beyond what we've seen already, and where industrial and state capacities are still very limited? So the last bit, industrial and industrial and state capacities are still very limited. You're gonna go for just one? Okay, I've got one more here. Um, <laughs> it's similar. How to scale and expand design technologies like the one you shared? What are the main barriers? Any incentives, regulations set up by local governments or others in architecture competitions, infrastructure procurement to promote the use of valuable technologies like this? All similar. Uh, that's it. Do you want to just? Um, mine was my contribution to the previous question. Right. Okay. okay. So maybe I'll take that whilst Michael's having a think about this stuff. Perfect. Okay. Um, no, I just wanted to say uh, the thought about kind of resourcing and mining, and I think um, I wanted to touch on two things. Something that you said about the local resource and the global thinking. Uh, I think it also comes into um, the global distribution of where it's really worth using these resources. So using kind of photovoltaics and the materials that it takes to make those in those kind of scenarios, yes. Uh, using the lithium that's required to make batteries for private electric vehicles that people then are used to, as a second car is not a good way of using those resources. So one thing is about the, the distribution of those resources for the right thing. And secondly, um, in some of these kind of very energy intensive materials like uh, aluminium, for example, that's where we pay into the circular economy. And that's where we start to urban mine and we see where have we already used that energy to make those resources into materials that are used for buildings and where can they be reused in good ways at the end of life of one kind of building. Thank you. Michael, I give you one minute, one minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
Josh, could you just clarify the first question? What was the bit about industri industrial and state capacities? Well, the, the, this is a Global South example, I guess, of, of Nigeria, uh, where there's 180 million people will be added to urban areas. And the, I don't know who, who it is asked the question, whether it's a woman or a man, but the question was uh, that they're, they're saying that there, there are limited industrial and state capacities to deal with this massive urban expansion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, how do we do the very sophisticated mm -hmm. examples we've been talking about in that sort of context, I guess? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, I don't think there are many of these ideas that are inherently in, um, impossible to scale up. I think all, all of them can be scaled up. And, and I do think it is possible to create regenerative cities, kind of regardless of the size. Um, the whole topic of population growth, that's a it's quite a kind of contentious one. And thinking about spirodynamics, um, you know, in stage blue, population growth it would often be regarded as the, the fundamental problem, as a, the, the root of um, a lot of the environmental problems. It's not what I think. In stage orange, which is the sort of free market stage, population growth goes out the window as a concern because there's a belief that there's nothing there are no kind of limits to growth and then in stage green the view on population was that it really isn't a problem and the whole problem is consumption um, and I think if you were to take a sort of stage yellow integrated view of that you'd say well yes it is largely about consumption and, and reducing consumption but population growth is also a challenge and, and one of the the most successful ways of dealing with that is likely to be to increase overseas aid up to say 0.7% per, per nation because there are examples of countries that have gone through a very rapid demographic transition. So for instance, Iran went from nearly six children per, per adult female to about 2.1, just above replacement in the space of just 15 years, all to do with um, improvements in healthcare and changes in the, in the, the roles of women. Um, and so I think um, there is a case for increasing overseas aid and, and helping um, countries that are early on in the de demographic transition go through that more quickly. And that, that would help them achieve a much better quality of life as well. Um, so clearly m massive cities are, are going to be really difficult if they're, if they're unplanned. But if they are planned along regenerative lines... Um, then I, I think it's perfectly possible to create a good quality of life for, for everyone in them. Uh, barriers and incentives to these ideas. Um, well, it, it, it is partly about inertia. Um, so there are still a lot of people stuck in existing ways of doing things, very resistant to change. We've noticed that in Architects Declare. Um, but really, I think um, the change needs to happen at a, at a systems level. And, and we need to uh, you know, rethink the, the way that, that we tax things. It, it's kind of insane at the moment that there are tax incentives to demolish ra rather than refurbish. It should be the other way around. And I also mentioned earlier the idea of shifting taxation away from labor, nothing inherently wrong with labor, more towards the use resources which would really stimulate um, innovation. Um, then, well, other barriers and incentives. Um, I think uh, at the moment, a lot of the sort of big name architects are perhaps stuck in a kind of consumer mindset. And what I mean by that is that um, some of them are creating really quite kind of flashy buildings for big name, for, for big cities or luxury brands. And for me, that's that's just part of the consumer mindset. You know, the, the city is the consumer and, and the big name architect is the kind of luxury handbag producer. And I hope that we will be moving into a, more of a citizen mindset where we're much um, more willing to, to actually challenge the starting points uh, of projects. And so rather than just choosing from what's on the menu and, and uh, specifying greener materials, we start to ask whether we really need this project in the first place and whether we can actually satisfy the, the client's needs without a building. Uh, and I think that we're in the early stages of that shift. And um, John Alexander's book, I think, is very good on that, um, Citizens, uh, about that shift from seeing ourselves as consumers and, or conscious consumers um, towards seeing ourselves as citizens.
Great, thank you, Michael. So we have drinks upstairs, so if you have more questions, we can take upstairs. I just want to thank you very much, Michael. That was a you know, fantastic, stimulating, creative, interesting talk. SKT made very clear this topic is very close to IP, IPP's heart, so it gave us lots to think about. It is refreshing, actually, to hear that Snyder growth or the growth is something else. I promise you we're going to make sure we're going to use maximizing planetary health we're gonna go for that that direction and let's keep this conversation going uh, i think all of us we are convinced that we need to rethink our concept of uh, no idea of sustainability if anything the picture of the operation uh tat drop traumatized oh, us. Drop. that was enough to traumatize us so we're gonna probably think about it more about when when you're gonna intervene in some um you know trying to find solutions but yeah please join me to say thank you, thank you. Some copies of my book, if you if you'd like to. Um, it's the same price as that website that doesn't um, pay us taxes. So. <laughs>